How's everybody doing? Lunch, full, sleepy, right? Okay, so I'm going to do my best to keep everybody awake, and I hope I can actually do so, so bear with me. Okay, so one of the things I always like to do to kind of get a talk going is, you know, an exercise where I like to kind of experiment on the audience a bit, so be my lab rat if you wish, okay? So what I'm going to do, I need you guys to all pay attention here, I'm going to show a slide next, and it's going to have two different products. They're basically identical. There's some extra information about them. I want you to look at each one, and I'm going to ask you to raise your hand eventually on which one you want to buy. Can you guys do that? You ready? You guys are an organized bunch, so this should be fine. Okay, here we go. Take a close look at each one. Okay, so I'm going to vote as well. And I want to know who would buy product A. Wow, okay, very good. Okay, who would buy product B? Well, you guys are cheapskates in the corner there. <laughs> so that's the Dutch contingent right there. <laughs> so who raised their hands for product A again? Can you put your hands up? Perfect, you're in the front. So, I'll, I'll say whatever you're saying. Why did you buy product A? What was interesting about it? Easily manipulated by reviews. Well, you're, you're honest. Okay. So that is right. It's the reviews. And what's interesting is I pulled this data from Amazon. This is real. They're identical. I changed the order of the colors on the bottom, but you can get that one in green, you can get that one in blue. It's the same toothbrush. One just happens to cost them was twice as much as the other one. The only difference is the reviews. 834 versus 10. This guy is selling 80 times more of the exact same toothbrush than this guy. And you're German, you should see through all of that stuff, right? <laughs> Unbelievable. But what's amazing about this is the power of influence. It's amazing. Social validation is one of the most powerful things out there. We see reviews, we trust other people made the right decision for us, and we're actually willing to spend more money for the exact same item just because other people did the same. And when you look at that, right, what does influence then really mean? It's not having power over something. That's a very scary way of looking at it. It's the ability to alter or move the flow of a decision-making process. We, the consumer, know that a, that other toothbrush costs almost twice as much, but we're okay with it, right? So I wanted to take a look at influence, and nobody knows how to manipulate more than the United States. So we figured, let's take a look at U.S. history, right? It's okay. I have a U.S. passport. I have a Dutch passport. I'm going to make fun of both countries. Don't worry about it. 1704 was the first recorded advertisement in a newspaper. It was for real estate. And then eventually the first ad agency came around, but obviously they couldn't do Mad Men in 1843. That's not going to make any sense. It's going to be the most boring thing ever. But then in 1936, Consumer Reports came along. And what was really interesting about Consumer Reports is they, they were a group that took experts, industry experts, who then review something and say, we like this vacuum cleaner. The suction of it is really good and it picks up dust, blah, 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 blah. And people said, okay, that's, that's an expert. It's somebody who knows what they're talking about. And when we hear someone we believe is an expert, we tend to listen. It's, it's just instinctive. It's, it's coded into how we operate as a society. And then the first television commercial came around, Comerica. Okay. So Belova was the ad. It was a watch company. It was a 10-second ad. It was a still image. And they just said, buy our watches, buy our watches, buy our watches. And people bought the watches. Back then, they had about 2,000 people watch the ad. And there was a huge hit. I guess there only were 2,000 televisions out there around that time. But then, in the 50s, there was a fundamental shift in how we sell and how we spend Tupperware parties. So I don't know if you guys know what Tupperware is. It's, it's really a joke. It's a plastic container that stores food, right? That's it. It's expensive. I don't know why it's so expensive, but it is. And they did these Tupperware parties where the brand said, man, how are we going to sell people on these plastic containers when they have plates and bowls that they could already store food in? Let's create these parties where we find people in the neighborhood are able to socially organize other people. 
and actually create these events. So a Tupperware party was thrown typically by, you know, the woman of the household with all the other people. They would come in and they would discuss life and kids and their husbands and whatever else not, and then she would sell them the Tupperware and get a commission. But she was the social node, the social capital to start that process. And that was in the 50s, and that was where it fundamentally changed for brands and how they sell and how they campaign. Because they started saying, gee, our, our consumers are actually our best asset. If they can become fanatical about what we do, we're going to be more effective. So then we skipped 30 years. It was only the invention of the silicon chip, no big deal. And in 1993, Webcrawler came out. And that was the first time you had full text search, which was a really big deal because what happened is people can access the internet and search for something. And that never really happened before. And then Google came around, and you know the Google model is we can do better, right? And that's what they do, and typically, unfortunately, they're right. They are better at most other products. And then in 2004, Facebook came along. And what was interesting about that is was the creation of online communities. We're able to get together, discuss life, share what they're up to, and do it in a way that simply did not exist before. So don't look at this as, you know, just big names on there. Look at what the impact was with society, right? Twitter is another example. And in 2009, my company, Kickstarter and Indiegogo, all three of us kind of launched and started taking over the crowdfunding space. And now we're in 2015. Let's see if we can get this guy to... There we go. Very nice. So. One of the interesting things to look at is not how somebody votes or how many likes you have or how many tweets. I like to kind of look at influence and spending. And I want to show you some interesting examples that tie back into some of the other talks we heard today, such as the Ben and Jerry's one. And it's how do brands influence us to spend? And let's take that idea and, and flip it around and say, how do we influence how brands behave? Because at the end of the day, we're the consumers, right? So if we buy a product, there's a reason for it. So let's look at it that way. Let's see how we actually influence brands. So I don't know if you guys have read about this campaign, Starbucks is Race Together, the biggest fiasco in the history of Starbucks. These geniuses decided to create a campaign where baristas would serve you copy, coffee and they'll talk about race relations in the process. <laughs> I don't know what agency gave them that idea, but I'm, I'm pretty sure they don't have Starbucks as a client anymore. And what was amazing about this is the riots are going on, like there was riots in Detroit, in LA, in New York, people really shouting and complaining, and Starbucks says, we want to be part of that, we're going to have these conversations. They didn't realize that you know, about 70 to 80% of their clientele is white, but 80% of the people that work at Starbucks is non-white. That doesn't work, guys. Like, you can't have a conversation about race relations in, in that kind of a dynamic. So Starbucks wanted to talk about race. The customer became uncomfortable. And what did the customer do? They just stopped shopping there. They went to Dunkin' Donuts instead. Dunkin' actually said thanks to Starbucks because their sales went up during that period. It's really fascinating. And then you see the people on Twitter are really saying, mean, hateful stuff because they just did not want to do this. They didn't want to go and pay way too much money for a cup of coffee and then have somebody go to them and say, you want to talk about race relations at 7 o'clock in the morning when you're on your way to work? <laughs> I don't. But what's amazing about that is we as consumers said we're not going to spend, right? So when a brand like Starbucks, a multinational, multi-billion dollar brand comes along and says, we're going to have this conversation, and the consumer says, no, we're not. The way that they do that is saying, no, we're not. We're not going to buy your product. And basically, when that happens is they say, OK, we're not going to talk about race. You, you win. And no coffee company in the United States will ever try to talk about race, nor should they be. And what's amazing about that is you basically had influence. Your coffee purchase made an impact. And when you look at it that way, we as consumers actually drove the identity of the brand. It's not the other way around. The agencies that work with the brands might help you explain what you're hoping to accomplish. But if we as consumers do not believe that in five years' time we want to be affiliated with that, we're not going to buy the product. Why do people buy Apple products? Typically, it's because in two to five years' time, they still believe that they want to be where Apple is. 
because those products are so damn expensive, you have to wait two to five years to buy the next one anyway, right? And that's what's so interesting about it. It's not just about how good of a product it is, it's how it makes you feel and how you identify with it. So let's look at something else. Let's look at disruption. So Netflix, these are the guys who basically killed every video take out there, right? So they those don't exist anymore. They made Blockbuster file for bankruptcy. And there's a reason for that. So what I want to do is actually put on our business school hats. As a disclosure, I did not go to business school, so I, I kind of make fun of them as much as I can. So we're going to put on our business school hats, which means we're going to look at it a little bit greedy, a little bit pessimistic, and say, what is wrong with the Netflix model? And we're going to go before it was instant. Let's go back to when they were mail order. So they're a mail order service. That's really slow. Do you ever do the math around this? And remember, subscriptions do not exist yet. Instant delivery did not exist. I wanted to see a movie. They have to mail it to me. It took two to three days. Then I would watch the movie, maybe. And then I would mail it back to them. It takes two to three days. And then they'll mail it back to me, the next movie. So if you're in business school and you look at that and you say, that's, that's horrible. There's too much latency in the delivery of your product, right? That's how they speak. They like to use words they don't know anything really about. So there's too much latency in the system. You have to fix that. It's not going to work. And then there's no impulse or mood buying, right? So think about it this way. I want to watch a comedy. It's like Wednesday night. You know, my wife and I had a long day uh, at work and we want to watch something funny. But I might have submitted in my Netflix queue a horror movie. And you know what? Too bad for me. That's the movie I have to watch. While a video rental store, I could just go on my bike, feats, right? And go to the store, pick up my movie, and come back and watch it. I was in control. But with mail order, I wasn't. So it's another, the business school would again say, use our taste and preference. It's not working. What are you doing? What's wrong with you people? And then subscription models did not exist yet. We were used to buying everything in units. Right? This is a long time ago. Everything was in a unit. You buy one of something, you buy two of something. There's no membership. did not exist. Okay, how many movies did I have to watch to make that price make sense? A lot. So why would the user do that? Saying, I can't watch two movies a week. That's crazy. Obviously, the answer is yes, you can. You can watch a movie every day if you wanted to. In fact, you can do 12 hours of Netflix back to back if you really were dedicated. And it, and it worked. But there's a reason for that, and it's because the early people who used it loved the service. They loved it. They said, this actually is great. We have access to all this information that did not exist before. We had access to these collections that did not exist before. And then their friends started using it too. And then their friends and their friends and their friends. And in business schools, they call this the threshold model of collective behavior. It's a spiffy little graph that means very little. But what's interesting about it is you got innovators in the beginning. And innovators are the people who are actually creating the product. And you got the early adopters, they start using it. And then eventually, if there's enough social capital, the, the next group comes in, the early majority, and then the late majority. And then you have 70, 80% market share. And then eventually, your grandparents, which are typically that 16% group, it's like the 65 and plus, they start using it as well. And once they had all the people, then they actually fixed those problems. Now movies are instant. You can, they can make recommendations based on your mood. And the subscription model is so cheap that they have single-handedly caused movies to cost zero dollars. We don't spend any more for the content. We, we spend for the delivery of the content to our TV screen. It's the same reason why live events for music are more profitable than anything else, because we pay for the experience. Content has been killed in recent years, and Netflix is one of the reasons for that. Okay, so why do we spend, right? So campaigners, political analysts, guys who play with data, they love talking about, let's see if this idea becomes something greater. Is it just gonna be in that niche, or is it gonna break out and become part of the majority? How do we analyze that? And I think what we need to look at instead is why do we actually spend, right? How did we all get you to open up your wallets and pay for today. There's a reason for that. Why do you ever spend money on anything? Let's, let's actually break it down. Let's see what it looks like. So why do we spend? We believe in the person or the idea. WWF, you believe what they're up to, you like nature, great. You give them money. You have, let's say, an uncle who needs a little bit extra funds because he's starting a business. He might give them 
uh, money as well because you know them. If a best friend who asks for five euros for a beer, you might give it to them or not, and then you're not really friends in my opinion. But the point is, there's a person and there's an idea. And that's essential to one of the reasons we spend. And then you got the movement. And that's one of the most powerful reasons why we spend money. It's being part of something. It's why we wear certain types of clothes, because it identifies with a certain type of group. It's amazing. Everything we wear, everything we do is part of being part of a movement. Everybody here is part of a movement. It's the Campaigning Summit movement, and we're having it today. And we're spending money to be part of that. It's one of the most powerful drivers out there, period. And then there's product. It's why we go into the Starbucks and spend way too much money for a way too small coffee, right? We give somebody a euro and we get something in return. That's easily understood. It makes sense. And then there is the return on investment. And everybody says, this is really important. I want to know how much money I get for something. So I give you a euro, you give me two euros back. It's a great deal. What's interesting about that is it's the least powerful reason to why we spend. I don't care if you're a venture capitalist or just a person investing in the stock market. You don't just look at the number and say, how much am I going to get back? You're going to look at the person. You're going to look at the idea. You're going to look at who else is part of it and what the product is. Everything else has to click before anything here happens. When Warren Buffett invests on something in the stock market, suddenly that ticker goes up. Why? It's not because of that. It's because they want to be part of the Warren Buffett movement. They believe in the person. That's really the driver. Return of investment is like, a safety net for people who need to justify something that they already have instinctively, right? Like, this is a good investment, this is a good deal, I want to do it. And they need to, like, have it make sense on paper. This is for the quant people, the mathematicians and the analysts. They like the, the return on investment. And what's interesting kind of about crowdfunding and really social funding is it addresses all of those points, right? It actually captures all the reasons to why we spend. And people who do fundraising for nonprofits or political campaigns, they struggle with these same issues. And crowdfunding kind of touches base on that as well. So what I'm going to do is kind of break down an example of what a crowdfunding project would look like without using a real project. So we're going to keep it in the abstract. So you, uh, every project is a, it starts with a person, an idea, a story, a narrative. And what's interesting about that is, and we have so much data on it, that a, a project without a, an individual who's running it does not do well. The biggest mistake people make when they're trying to raise funds is there's no human. There's no individual to relate to. There'll be like XYZ Corporation. There's no identity. And you need to have a human identity so people can relate, they can connect, they can be part of that idea. And that's the beginning of a crowdfunding project. You don't have this, you're not going to do well. And then the network. It's that threshold model we were discussing earlier. What's fascinating about funding, and I don't care what kind of funding it is, if you're raising funds, look at the first few dollars you actually get. They're almost always from people you know or, or you've dealt with in the past. They're the first people to believe in you. They're the first people to jump in. They're the first people to make a difference. It's kind of like high school, right? So American high schools, and I'm sure German high schools are very different, but I'm pretty sure that there were dances with boys and girls at both of them. So we can still use this example. And you have a dance, right? And you got boys on one side, you got girls on the other side. There's music playing, but nobody's on the dance floor, right? And typically, somebody starts. Somebody shows up and starts dancing. Ideally, it's like the cool guy or the cool girl in the school. Sometimes it's not. But when it is the cool guy or the cool girl in the school, and I was not one of them, is the rest of the group showed up. Everybody else started dancing because there's validation. And when you're doing fundraising, it's that validation that you have to start with, that network that makes a difference. And then we got the reward. What's interesting about this is don't think of it just as a physical product, but fundraising campaigns that have a reward associated with it do exceptionally well. Because now we got the person, the idea, and the product all in one place. And it's amazing. And the reward is not necessarily just about the product. In this case, it was a shoe out of El Paso, Texas. It's actually about what it means to you as an individual. They're unique. They're customized. They create a connection. And return on investment can be done as well through equity crowdfunding. It's doable. It's not as exciting as what else is going on, but it is something that could be done. 
and we can address that later. So really what we have here is socially driven capital. So I know some people like to take notes, so here's a good little sentence for you. Crowdfunding is the conversion of social capital into financial capital. So you can scribble that one down. And, and when you look at that as a mechanism, it's really interesting because we were just talking about the fact that capital and how we spend is exceptionally influential in how brands behave, right? So then suddenly, if we found a way to convert social capital, which is intangible, into financial capital, what we're actually doing is talking about influence. So it's not if this is going to shape society in the future, it's how it's going to shape it. It's going to happen. So, for, his name is Future, so I had to use it. It's just too funny to me. And when you look at, you know, what the future is going to mean, let's look at it not as a recipe, right? A business is not started by following a recipe. A campaign is not started by following a recipe. Anybody who says, this is the five-step plan to launch your company, or this is the seven-step plan to, like, start your campaign, you should walk out of that room as fast as you can, because there is no such thing. It does not exist. Bullet points are fake. And... Really, it's all about the connections, right? Who do we know? How do we leverage them? How do they leverage us? Because value has to go both ways. If it doesn't, you have a problem. And what does that mean moving forward? Well, expect to see brands and social funding play together, okay? So expect to see Amazon and eBay and maybe even some of the other groups out there, like Etsy, start playing around with social funding. Don't worry, it's not like you're going to go to Amazon and suddenly there's going to be like a crowdfunding campaign pop up there, but there's going to be some kind of play of it happening. One of the examples that we did with this was with Chrysler in the Dodge Dart Registry. We did this one back in 2012. It won the uh, bronze line at Cannes Film Festival. And what was fascinating about it is we worked with Chrysler to allow people to socially purchase cars. If you were like, what? What the hell are you talking about? How's that even possible? So what we did is we allowed people to create a Dodge Dart car. It's a very cheap $15,000, $16,000 car, very accessible. And they then would push it out there for their social network to help them fund it. So who do you guys think did really well with this? What kind of a campaign would do really well buying cars? Anybody has an idea? No? Too much in shock? OK. So weddings. People about to get married did really well with this, because they said, we're about to get married, we need a car, do you guys want to help us out? And all their friends came out and helped them. We, had, we did this for about one quarter, so three months. We had 6,000 registries created. Three months. For, car, for a car company, that's really good. We had 2,000 press mentions and 70 million impressions that went to this. That just shows you how impactful this actually is. Social funding, like, and people are saying, well, how does that even make sense? But it does, because it made sense for those communities. And at the end of the day, they're the ones spending, so if it works for them, it works for the brand, right? So look at this, transmedia. It's another good future one. Expect in the future television networks to incorporate crowdfunding into their regular programming. Imagine if you can watch, like, Shark Tank or Dragon's Den and actually say, you know what, I disagree with the sharks, I'm going to invest from my house, from my phone. That's, that's definitely crowdfunding. It's definitely social funding, and it's very, very possible. There's some regulatory issues with it. Every country is unique, including Germany. But this is going to actually happen. And we did this with A&E Networks, Project Startup. It's one of our initiatives. They're the first network in the United States to work with a platform like ours and bring this to the mainstream. And I'm all about doing that, because when we look at the threshold model, I want to break it away from early adoption. So those who fund a Rocket Up project, a Kickstarter project, an Indiegogo project, right now you're all early adopters. You're, you guys are not mainstream, by the way, just so you know, and feel good about that too, by the way. You're not mainstream. Mainstream doesn't sit in a room like this, right? You're early adopters. So when you look at it that way, television is really the way for us as a business to get to that next stage. So we did this with A&E Project Startup. And we did live tours, we did events with television shows, we combined the two, we, we took campaigns from our site and paired them up with television stars and they did really, really well. And there's a documentary coming out about it uh, a little bit later this year and we can all take a look at it. But one of the interesting things is online communities. So all the different talks today have all been touching base on this to some extent. Nobody has neglected the online, right? Like you really shouldn't be at this stage anymore. 
but you got groups like, you know, Reddit, eFactor, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook. These are real groups, these are real companies, and they have established bases. So Facebook, for example, when the earthquake happened in Nepal, there was this little blurb that showed up on the top that says, do you want to donate to a, re uh, a Red Cross relief fund for the earthquake in Nepal? And they were being able to send that out to hundreds of millions of people, right? That's really powerful because they have an established network. So one of the things I would say keep an eye out for in the future is kind of these online communities leveraging the existing groups that they have. And a lot of them don't have the expertise yet in-house, so Reddit tried this. They created something called Reddit Made. It got shut down earlier this year. It was very, very popular. It was too popular, and they didn't know how to scale it. So what happened is they said, we want every Reddit product to come through our curation model. And we're going to hold their hand, we're going to walk them through the process, and we're going to help them launch. But you can't do that with a platform that has millions of users. It's impossible. So they failed. And then one of the interesting things, and I'm able to talk about it today, and it's the first live event I'm able to, to discuss this at, so let's see how it goes. But eFactor is an example of this. They're a company that is basically in possession of the largest entrepreneurial network in the world. They have millions of entrepreneurs. And they, they acquired my company two, three weeks ago. And why they did that was because they want to leverage what we do as a group with their larger network. So now RocketUp is actually an e-factor company. So if you want to talk about trends, it's definitely happening. I, I could, I'm living an example of it. Networks are incorporating. So then if we look at what does this actually all mean, right? Like what's the, what's the big deal? Well, brands like to monetize things. They're starting to recognize that social capital and social funding is impactful. So there is going to be monetization of the process. There is going to be a change in society and how this works. But what's interesting is what's going to happen in the next year or two, not five years, but a year or two, is crowdfunding is going to change from an innovative tool, right, to an actual way of doing. That's a big jump to make. A tool is something people play around with and then they forget about it and they leave it. But a way of doing, in the future, what's going to happen is you have an idea, you have a campaign, you have a project. This is how you make it happen. And we've had all types of projects come to our site. So our companies partnered with the Department of State, the White House, and a few other groups have been using us to disrupt social politics in emerging regions through crowdfunding. One example is there was a, a shelter in Morocco that raised funds for our site in order to create a protective environment for women to go to from battered households. There's no way the Moroccan government was going to give them money for that. They don't really get along well when it comes to gender neutrality and equality. So we came in instead for the State Department. They raised thousands of dollars. They built this center. They got the security team, and they're starting the process of doing education. So it shows you just how effective this can be in different capacities. Okay, so here we go. Anybody who wants to reach out to me, I'm on Twitter. Very easy to find. Thank you.